always so worried I'm gonna trip on the way up here and it'll just set the whole thing on a bad foot. He's like, yeah, whatever. Lucky, lucky us, I guess. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming, guys. And thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, this is wild. Obviously, I have many things to ask you about the book for sure. a thousand notes in here. So, <sighs> reading the book feels like real life, but it's a novel. Mm -hmm. How much of it is based on your own experience and your own family? I always think about it as though it's, it's based on my, um, my grandmother, my mom's mom, Joanna Moore, who, um, you know, I, I only met a couple of times when I was very young, but I, you know, we heard tidbits about growing up, and, and I think she was considered a kind of uh, cautionary tale in my family, a sort of a waste of potential or something like that. And so I, always, I think about it like it's based on her entirely, and then everyone, everything else is kind of um, in some version of me, in some capacity. You know, I felt, um, I was very clear, like there was a lot of stuff. I would look on the internet for, I mean, she was this B-movie actress that, you know, essentially couldn't get out of her own way and had a lot of potential. And um, I... You know, I tried my best to not interview my mother and, and not make it too based on reality. I wanted it to be about this exploration of me trying to understand this woman. And in doing so, the best thing I heard about the book was that while it's clearly based on her, she becomes, the, the character of Dorothy becomes her own character in, in herself. And I guess I'm sure everyone is wondering, of course, knowing who you are, why the decision to explore a character based on your grandmother versus your parents. I mean, you've got two sort of celebrity powerhouses with such interesting histories, but you found a different kind of compelling story in someone mm -hmm. I don't think anyone else would have even guessed would be the subject of a book. I guess I didn't want it to be, you know, I think in doing it about my parents, it would become too much about myself. You know, I wanted it to be, um, I, I was always a fiction writer, and, and while it is based on somebody that I, you know, that comes from my family. I didn't want it to be uh, a memoir. I didn't want it to be sort of salacious, tabloid, kind of celebrity gossip. I wanted it to be just an exploration of this woman that I found um, interesting and that I felt I had a connection to, you know, in some of her struggles with um, addiction and sort of uh, her, you know, I think when she felt um, success coming, she often... Um, would get in her own way and, and you know, because I didn't, she, she didn't feel as though she deserved it. And I think that's something that I always felt I had in myself as well. The book feels very much like what I think any of us who know someone who's gone to sort of make it big in L.A. and has sort of had moderate success, kind of fallen off the map, maybe didn't work out the way they had wanted. It feels so real for so many people's stories. Mm -hmm. When you look back at Dorothy's life, what do you feel about her? I think that she was in, um, you know, a ball of talent and, and um, a, a, one of the beautif most beautiful women I've ever seen. And I think that she um, could have been something really amazing. I just think her lack of belief in herself... You know, and a couple of, you know, I think this is, it's this way with a lot of actors in Hollywood, a couple of wrong turns here and there, and you can really, you know, um, go off course. And it's not even your fault, it's luck, and it's, you know, it's most, like they always say, it's, I don't know, it's 1% of actors make it or something. And, and I always found um, a kind of kinship and a, and a really, I found it really interesting, the uh, these sort of, um, just outside of Hollywood. You know, the people that are trying to make it, you know, the actors that turn a certain age and realize that, you know, maybe they're just gonna be a waiter, you know, or they sort of, uh, that, that, that feeling of like, wow, this, this might not work out, I always have found to be a really um, an interesting place to, uh, to sort of dive into um, the understanding of a kind of humanity I think we can all, we all share. In so many books, there are the good guys and the bad guys and the protagonist and the antagonist, and those roles are very clearly defined. But in life, we're all kind of those things. Right. And in this book, it feels like Dorothy and Dale, particularly, mm -hmm. are both those things. Right. How, what do you think is the deciding factor as to why two people with 
a certain degree of talent who both aren't that great mm -hmm. as people and aren't that bad as people, one becomes just astronomically successful and then the other decides at a certain age that they're just going to become a waiter. Right. Well, I don't even know if they decide that. I think it's decided for them in a lot of ways. And I think it's just a series of, uh, you know, it's, you, you never know. You know, I, I, I think that in this book, I think that I definitely have more empathy for the character of Dorothy versus Dale. And I think that there's a kind of ruthlessness that it takes to get to the top that I think that she was unable to. She didn't want to step on anybody. She just wanted it to be because she was good. And I don't think that that, I think a lot of uh, that world has a lot more to do with your, um, your desire to, uh, to not only get to the top, but to make sure everyone else doesn't, you know? And I think that he has that quality, and I'm not sure Dorothy does. So I think there's probably less empathy for him because that's not something that I you know, care for either. How much of the book mirrored real life? I mean, there was struggles with um, professional struggles and personal struggles and struggles with addiction and struggles mm -hmm. with being a good parent. How much of that did you pull from stories that you've actually heard about your grandmother? Um, not as much as you'd think. I mean, a lot of the stories were based on stuff that I'd been through, stuff that um, I'd heard about, stuff that, you know, there were these moments that I, I tried to kind of these flagpoles, these facts that I'd heard that, you know, I remember it was this thing I read about how she, um, she like got onto a plane and then couldn't find her luggage and accused the airline of stealing it. And I read that sentence and that became like 40 pages. So it was a lot of that kind of stuff where it was, you know, I was trying to take these things and trying to sort of piece together you know, it wasn't the story of Joanna. It was my understanding of, of maybe how somebody could end up that way. And you completed the novel during a very difficult time in your life. I mean... I did, indeed. Yeah. You'd been arrested. You've gone to rehab. And did, I think anybody can agree it's pretty remarkable that there is where you found the sort of the strength and the power to actually finish a successful novel. I actually... Uh, I actually... Uh, this is embarrassing in a way, but I, I woke up one morning and my agent called me and said, hey, we found somebody that wants to sell your book. And I thought, wow, this is the best day of my life. You know, how exciting. And I went out celebrating and I got arrested that night buying drugs. And uh, the scariest thing I ever went through was being in jail for 20 hours or something and thinking, because I hadn't signed yet, I had just agreed, and thinking that they had pulled the deal. And they didn't want to have anything to do with me anymore. And um, it was only when I got out and uh, they told me they still wanted to do business with me that I realized that uh, it was almost like Joanna became my kind of guardian angel. And I had to do it for her. You know, I had to be better for her. And, and since then, I think I, I have been. Or at least I've tried to be. You know, there... It's like that's what allowed me to understand. She never got when she... It was when she, she thought she was just making mistakes and trying to be better and then making mistakes. And she never realized that, that it, was, it was her own fault a lot of the time. It was her own disbelief in herself. And I think going through that, I finally sort of allowed myself to say, um, you know, this could be something and, um, and allow that to be okay. And uh, I think she helped me do that. There was, there's almost a reflective quality in the main character right. and in yourself, especially considering what you said when we first sat down about how um, she could have been something great, but she kept getting in her own way. I yep. mean, that is a perfect example of you got this major opportunity with yep. something that you worked really hard for, and you just went and got in your and own I way. And I got in my own way, and I almost screwed it up. And I think that was the moment when I realized that that was, I wrote that sentence afterwards, that was what became the thesis of the book. And I, you know, and I uh, helped me to not do that anymore, I hope. And, uh, it was an amazing thing that I guess I, I thought of her as a character I was writing about until that moment. And I went, like, I, maybe I'm writing about myself, too, you know. Is that cathartic? Was it cathartic yeah, for you to write? absolutely. To write as this character, knowing yeah. that part Yeah, and then after, after that, I did go to rehab. And what was really interesting is that the book ends in Palm Springs. And um, that's where my grandmother passed away. And then I, uh, I actually went to rehab in Palm Springs. So while I was there, I, I got to really write about what it's like there and how miserable it is and how uh, hot it is and 
how uh, I finally, under, it was crazy to be finishing the book and, fin and writing about her death at the place that she actually died, and it felt um, cosmic. You know, it felt like, um, it felt like uh, serendipity, I would say, something like that. Yeah, it was kind of, um, it, was, it was surreal. But it, 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 I think it made the book even better and more, it made me finally, it was like the last piece of the puzzle. Do you think the book would be what it is had you not stumbled and pulled yourself together? No. No, I think it was necessary. I think it could have been okay, but it wouldn't have been as heartfelt. It wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have entirely understood her the way I end up having to, to that last step of like, I wasn't writing about somebody, that, that last piece of understanding. It was almost like I finally forgave both her and myself for the ability to make mistakes and the ability to sort of, um, you know, that disbelief in yourself is something that I think can be, just like addiction can be passed down from generation to generation. And I knew I shared that with her. And I, and I you know, actually I thought I shared that with her. And then I got arrested and I knew, you know. That'll and do it. That'll do it. That was, uh, yeah, exactly. Perfect. What was the reaction of your own family when they turned around and were able to read the book? Because a lot of what you've been saying is that so much of these experiences um, were based on things that you've experienced growing yeah. up. I mean, you had a very famous mother and a very famous mm -hmm. father. Your mother famously suffered with her own bouts with addiction mm -hmm. when you were a child. And in your own words in interviews, your father wasn't exactly warm and fuzzy. So when they turn around and look at this sort of fictional reflection of truth, what is their reaction? Um... My mother was very scared to read the book for a long time. She's actually here somewhere. I don't know where she is. But, uh, I don't know where she went either. In the back or something. But, oh, oh okay, gotcha. Hi, Mom. Yeah, <laughs> hey, Mom. But um, she was scared for a long time to read it because she thought it would be maybe too truthful. You know, she went through a lot of hardships with her own mother, and, and she didn't know how it was going to feel. And, and then finally around when it all started happening, you know, she um, read it and she called me crying and she said that she wished her mother could be here to see it. And she thought, while um, the empathy that I have for her and the sort of, um, it's not, I mean, I wouldn't say that it's a love letter to her because she certainly makes a lot of mistakes, but in some ways it was like somebody really trying to understand somebody that people had really given up on. And I think maybe... I've felt that way at times, and perhaps my mother has too. So she's been, oh, there she is. There she is. <laughs> Hi, Mom. Okay. You can watch right here. She's been entirely supportive, and, um, and so is my father and my stepmother. And it's less, not less so, but in a different way, because it's not, it's not about, you know, that side of my family. So it's been kind of a, a rallying cry for my mother and I to, uh, to re-look at the O'Neill side of the family and to attempt to, uh, I don't know, um, it's, I think it's made us closer for sure. A lot of, I mean, all of us have grown up differently. All of us have grown up sometimes with parents who didn't make any mistakes, parents who made a thousand mistakes, maybe we made mistakes. Mm. Uh, did this mend your relationship with maybe things you hadn't dealt with within yourself and with your family? Yeah, I think in the same way that it was uh, helped me to allow myself to forgive I think it really was also the final step in in in, for, in I th I think I thought I had forgiven my family and my mother and myself for all of these things and then when I actually went through it you know personally I think it was the last piece of total understanding of like oh you it wasn't a choice you know it's never a choice it's it's sort of much more complicated than that it has much more to do with um you know, it's hard to think outside of the moment when it's, uh, when it's all sort of crashing down like that. And I, I finally understood that. And, you know, like I said, that day was, you know, the best of times and the worst of times. It was almost like, like she, Joanne even get, never, or Dorothy never even got in her way the way I did. You know, it was never that exact. It was never like the morning and then the night, you know. So I was like, wow, maybe, you know, I really do... Uh, I really can uh, have the ability to screw up if I want to. But uh, we all do. Exactly. I think, and I think I, the greatest challenge of success is getting in your own way. Yeah. Or not even, thinking you can do it. And even with her, I think that, you know, uh, Dorothy has this. I think that if you, uh, I, I think if you're honest with yourself, everybody has some Dorothy in them. Everybody has some. Even if you, you know, say, I don't need 
that french fry and you eat it. You know you're doing something wrong, but you do it anyway. She just does it way, way, way worse and bigger than that. So that, I think if you look at that though, and you can, you can, you can I kind of understand that, that these things are kind of innately human. And depending on how, what you've been through, you know, you might act on them differently, but everybody has some of that in them, I think. Do you think your grandmother is proud of you? Um, yeah, I think she saved my life. I do. It's kind of a very beautiful sentiment. <laughs> yeah. I well. think something else that the, the book does outside of your own personal journey is sort of open up this idea of what real Hollywood looks like. Mm -hmm. And it's not pretty all the time. Towards the end of the book, actually in the chapter that shares the same title as the book. Right. I'm going to read a little part. All right. Start out saying, after what she considered a long and full repose, Dorothy decided it was time to go back to work. She didn't have much left after all the divorces, the moving, the surgeries, the booze, the pills, and the needles, and the everything else, the nameless everything else, the always and forever everything else. That is a story in this book that is a story maybe in your family, but that sounds like a story most people in Hollywood can understand. Yeah, yeah, it's a tough gig, for sure. And I think it's, um, I don't know, that, that, that ability, you know, that how hard it can be and how, and how really making it and how, how much luck it takes and, and how, you know, you can make these, you know, whether it's plastic surgery or, or medica self-medicating or whatever it is, there's so many ways to attempt to feel like you're still part of that world and and um it's very hard to stay in that world it takes a lot of luck and a lot of uh, i don't i don't even know what it takes you know i just find that that i just find it so tragic that moment when you you start to realize that it's you know it's moving farther and farther away you know i always thought of dorothy as having this you know let's say she's um there's a light at the end of a tunnel and she's walking towards it, but as the light gets farther and farther away, at times she thinks it's easier to just turn around because, you know, at least you know what's behind you. Even though it's black, you know what's behind you. The devil you know. Yeah, and I think that she, it becomes a lot easier for her to just think, that I'm never going to get back there, so I, gotta, I, need a, I need a minute to myself in the darkness. And that's so relatable. I mean, no matter what job you're in, we've all been there. You know, you just keep going and you keep going and it just, sometimes it doesn't go well. It's easy to stay on the straight and narrow when everything's going well, when yeah. everything's really successful and you can keep climbing up. Mm -hmm. But it's when the thing, when shit gets tough, yeah. that's when it's hard. And that decision to say, after everything I've been through, I'm ready to go back. I'm re yeah. Is that the mark of success? That is the person who turns around and says, it hasn't all been perfect, but I'm not stopping. Yeah, I think that's especially hard, though, when it's when um, it's not just based on you know workload and, and effort. When it's also based on vanity, and it's also based on as you get older, big things become even harder. And it's not just because you're really you know you could be really good, but as you know, it's I think it's as you get to a certain age, especially as a female in that time in Hollywood, it just was um, a remarkably challenging thing to go through. You know, she started to wear wigs, and, and then you just, you can't, you know. She, let's be honest, she started to wear wigs at 31, which freaked right. me out. Yeah. Woo! Yep. I was like, oh, And they just Lord. got bigger and bigger and bigger from that, that, from that on. So, yeah, I think it, uh, she was trying in her own way to, 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 to try and get back there, but you, you almost can't, you, the vision, the way you see yourself in the mirror is very different than the way everyone else sees you, I think. And especially when, when drugs and alcohol and, and, uh, and everything else, the nameless everything else, becomes um, a, a factor in the equation as well. All right, guys, let's open it up to some questions. Oh, we got one up front. All right. Hang on. We do? Slide on know. through, Sylvia, it's fine. Everyone say hi to Sylvia. Hi, Sylvia. Hi, Sylvia. Sylvia had a baby recently, and she still looks amazing. <laughs> when <laughs> Go did ahead. you first discover you wanted to be a writer? Um, I was in college. I was about 19. I never really uh, dealt with school that well. I, I felt went to a school in the city that it didn't feel like there was much of a creative outlet. And uh, I had this teacher 
I actually took a writing class, honestly, because it met once a week at night, and I thought, that's just perfect for my schedule. And, uh, and I had this teacher, and the first prompt ever was to uh, write from a woman's, or from the, the opposite sex's perspective. And um, the first thing I ever wrote was a version of something that's in the book, which is, was writing from my grandmother's perspective. And, and I wasn't even sure it was good, but the professor told me uh, that you have something here, and you had to keep going with this. And um, I've been in touch with him ever since, and it was like one of those real, it was almost like a, you know, one of those stories that I always heard that I never really bought into, that, that somebody like that could really change your life. And um, I did, I just kept going, and, and um, I remember there was, another, there was another moment I had when I was, I was, uh, was reading uh, A Movable Feast by Hemingway, and I didn't know much about the sort of practicality of writing, and I read this sentence, we ate well and cheaply and drank well and cheaply and slept well and warm together and loved each other. And I thought, oh, wow, you can do whatever you want. You know, you don't have to have commas or para. You can just do whatever you want. And then I was like, oh, okay, I can do this now. That's when I really decided that I wasn't sure I could fit into the box, you know, because I was so much about, I wasn't sure I could fit into what it meant to be a, a writer technically. But then once I saw that you could play and that you could kind of really find a voice and stick to that, that's when I really kind of knew that I wanted to pursue it full time. Go ahead. What do you think is like your uh, greatest challenge that you overcame or faced that defined you as a person or as a writer? Um, when I was arrested, uh, on the cover of the post it said, uh, it was like something like McEnroe's dopey son arrested. And I thought, God, if that's all I am, that is like such a nightmare, just some sort of, it was like, it was the worst thing that I ever thought of myself was just being a celebrity's child. And um, I really, at that point, was, was pretty low. But, but just the th idea that I'd kind of marred my family's name and that I had just defined myself in the way that I never wanted to be defined. I think going back to the book, and, and deciding that that's not who I am. The hardest moment was that, but then I think that the, one of the things I'm the most proud of was that I didn't give up and I didn't just let myself be, you know, McEnroe's dopey son. I cannot believe that came out of a headline from the New York Post. The cover, isn't that, Good I know. gracious. Assholes. Go ahead. <laughs> Ooh, there, oh, over there, sorry. Hi, I just wanted to know how you came up with the title, Our Town. Uh, it was, for a long time it was called Serenity Side Down. Um, but then I was talking to my editor, and he had there at, at one point at the end of the book, Our Town is a famous play, of, yeah, of course. And um, I don't know. If, and then so she at the end of the book um, goes back to acting and does like uh, public theater, and she does a production of Our Town. And I thought, you know, her as the um, this sort of narratorial presence and. I also like the idea of of the transference, of, like of you know Americana as like this real small or like a fake small town that's based in some sort of reality that became like you know Los Angeles of the '60s and '70s and '80s and trying to you know that became the American dream. I think for a long time it was like having a a successful business somewhere and a white picket fence, and then it became like you needed more than that. You needed celebrity. You needed that became what it what it was what what truly making it was, and I found that really interesting, and uh, I really liked um, her as the kind of the narrator and the sort of um, the playing off of that she's kind of wise, you know. When in fact, you know, I, even though I, in a way I think that she is through all of her struggles, but but I don't think you can really get there until the end and um, believing in that and like it was almost like I like. Uh, like, I believed in her, you know, I believed that she could guide you through this book in the same way the, the character does in Our Town. And I wanted to sort of uh, get that across from moment one. Hi. Hi. Um, could you see uh, Our Town, a novel, turn into Our Town, a movie? And if you could, who would you cast? Such a good question. <laughs> I love it. I actually am working on right now making it a television show. Yeah. Um, I'm working on I'm, I'm working on a pilot right now, and um, what I want to do is uh, 
have it go for a couple of seasons. So, because she goes from, from um, you know, her entire life. So I'd like to have it. I think it'd be hard to make a movie that you know we're in the same. It, it, it's it's a little bit too. Uh, there's the sca- the scope is a little bit too large, I think, to get it right in a movie. Um, I had this one idea to make it a three part miniseries with three different actresses. So somebody that's 18, somebody that's 35, and somebody that's 60, um, or something around there. And um, I was actually thinking of casting my mother as the, uh, the as her mother, which I thought would be. She She's likes on that. board. She likes that idea. She's absolutely <laughs> on board. Um, and I thought, yeah, and then it would be hard. The rest of it would be hard, but because I, it, to me, you should, there's nobody more beautiful than her at 18, so I'd have to find somebody that um, fit that mold in, in some capacity. But um, that's what I'd like to do. And my, I think it's, you know, because I don't know if there's a great, um, in the same way, in the vein of uh, Walter White and uh, Don Draper, there's these sort of male anti-heroes that you can get behind, even though they make a lot of mistakes. And I'm not sure there's been a female that's, that, that's gotten that much credit, and I'd love to, um, to be the person that could bring that to the screen. I think that she, uh, she deserves that. Plus, my editor calls it Mad Men on the PCH, which I kind of <laughs> like. So I think that that's sort of, uh, I like the way that sounds. I have a question. <laughs> Hit it. I do. I'm taking the last question. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Why in this world of like you just mentioned, a world of male anti-heroes, um, male protagonists, male stars. Uh, do you think that you found such a home writing a believable and understandable woman? I mean, as a woman, that's remarkable. We, we need more of that. And I, don't, I just don't know how in your mind you found that that was your home. People ask me that. I think it's... Um, I don't know how I... I didn't necessarily... Um do that much research. I guess I didn't think of it in, in sort of gender-specific terms. I just thought of it as, as trying to understand this person. And I think maybe that's a lot of the problem, is trying to, when you write for a woman, you're really trying to, like, write for a woman. And I just thought, she, she's just a person with struggles like everybody else. And, you know, I'm as vain as anybody, so I don't see why, you know, I couldn't, you know, go into that aspect of it or whatever. And I, I just felt like uh, in trying to connect to this person, it didn't... Um, you know, I understood her as a person, and I didn't think of her as, um, you know, I didn't want to be like, you know, go to a woman and be like, so what do I do now? I just thought that seemed ludicrous, you know. Women as people. Right. Who'd have thunk it? Right, exactly. Thank Who would have ever thought? Thank you so much for joining Thank us today. Thank you for having me. And if you haven't checked it out already, make sure you check out Our Town. Wave to whoever we're FaceTiming in the Hi, back. Ma. Mom's FaceTiming someone. <laughs> She's waving back. Thanks for coming and lending your support, Mom. And thank you so much for joining thank you us. Thank you again.